Well, we're just thrilled that they were able to take so much time out of their busy schedule to be with us today. Uh, specifically, you will see uh, that, that John and Mike are in the player development area, uh, working very closely in and with the minor league system and their general manager, Mark Shapiro. So what we want to explore here specifically are the eligibility rules and what we've been exploring all day in particular is when should and really why qualitatively, given the rules, a young uh, man should choose to turn a professional in the baseball realm. So I'm going to throw out a few sort of provocative rules, which I think we've all agreed on in meeting ahead of time. And, and then we're going to, as we've been doing throughout the day, mix and match and see how the rules, you know, fit up against the reality of a player's abilities, if that's okay with you, John and Mike. And again, uh, thank you for being with us. So the way the rules break out here is uh, a player is eligible for the first-year player draft if he's a resident of the U.S. or Canada, has never signed a major or minor league contract, and he's considered a resident if he has enrolled in high school or college, regardless of where the player is originally from. So you can take that as a given. And then the draft is covered in the official rules of Major League Baseball under Rule 4. The draft is held every June by a conference call among the 30 Major League clubs, and the draft lasts 50 rounds, which I'm sure is a stamina contest for you guys. There are proposed changes, however, to move the draft perhaps to a later date at the end of June. Uh, who can be drafted? Graduating high school seniors that have not yet attended college. Uh, any junior college player? Players that are attending a four-year college that have completed their third year? And players that turn 21 years old within 45 days of the draft? College players, how can they lose their eligibility? They will lose their eligibility if they reach any kind of an agreement with an agent. They are permitted to have an advisor, not an agent, during the draft process. The player may not use the advisor as the link between himself and the major league team. The advisor cannot have any direct contact with the professional team. He can provide advice about proposed professional sports contracts, but cannot represent that player in actual negotiations. So the club generally retains the rights to a drafted player until one week prior to the next draft or until the player enters or returns to a four-year college on a full-time basis. This is known as draft and follow. During that draft and follow year, scouts from other organizations are generally not permitted to have contact with the prospect. A selected pl player entering a junior college cannot be signed until the conclusion of the school's baseball season. Again, a club may not select a player again in a subsequent year when he's in a draft and follow mode unless the player has consented to the reselection. So I'm going to stop there before we get to Latin American players. And uh, everybody sort of understand the rules of the road, and I hope I stated them, generally speaking, pretty effectively. And, and ask uh, this, this provocative question, I guess. If we were, John and Mike, to change the Rule 4 draft from the time it is now to the end of June, how would that affect the likelihood of a young high school baseball player being drafted and therefore having to decide to turn pro as opposed to his going to college? Well, I, in conjunction with the change in the draft, what is also proposed is that a player recently drafted or in that year's given draft, he would not sign a contract for the given year. His contract would roll over to the subsequent year. He goes into an expanded instructional league rather than going to uh, Burlington, North Carolina, which is our entry-level club. Uh, reason being, uh, many times we get players out of the draft that are you know, seven months into their training season, as you just heard, the overtraining issue that we deal with when a first-year player comes in, what benefits we get out of that player uh, in their first year and the development that can take place. Uh, so ideally, it's a draft situation. They would sign a subsequent year contract uh, and then go into a, an expanded uh, instructional league. So uh, now, if you were to also take that to a, a college player, and I don't want to get off the beaten path, no, right ahead, it, please. it becomes an incentive to sign that player. The player wants to sign uh, and get out to a regular full-season club or even a Mahoney <coughs> Valley, for, for those who are familiar with the, the, the arrangement around here, uh, to begin his time clock. Time clock being that he's got three years of active service then to become protected on the Major League roster. Uh, otherwise, he's subject to the Rule 5 draft, which is something we'll get into in a minute. But uh, a lot of this and the proposal to move the draft later is to put him in an instructional setting first rather than putting him out in a full season league and then also to maintain another year of eligibility before that protection takes place. That's a lot to swallow. Any, we we, we want to give you a chance to ask <coughs> questions at any point along this uh, continuum. 
but, but if not, I, I do want to finish up. So, so Mike, here you are, a highly skilled high school athlete. You have the decision uh, to go to Princeton or turn pro. How would it change? Say you get drafted in the middle round. How would it have changed your decision? Uh, probably still go to Princeton, but uh, let's make it Arizona State or something like that. Well, I think, uh, you know, overall the, the biggest difference would be financial. You know, what, what was put on the table or what my estimated value would be in the open market. Uh, as we've come to find out or as we practice, there is, a, there is a class system within, players are drafted within, you know, different type of rounds. We allocate, maybe not specifically or, or overtly, but Players that are drafted at higher levels get more chances. They may get more attention, you know, more specific instruction. Uh, we just, with 150 potential players uh, every season, we may not be able to devote all of our attention to players that are drafted later and later on. And a lot of times, a lot of times, uh, the player that is given drafted a little higher maybe have a little more invested in them. Uh, they may get that attention. So. But, 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 yeah, that's, a, that's a, you know, I, I really didn't do you justice, but, but, but let me just set the stage here. You know, John oversees in his fourth season in Indian's director of player, player development, oversees all elements of the Indian's player development system, just so you kind of straighten Mike's in his fifth season, and he's the assistant director of player development. So and given that background and four or five years with the tribe, how do you make your way through the 50 rounds of the draft? What, why are you picking that kid? you know, that pivot point kid, high school, college kid, in the top 10, 15 rounds. And what are you doing, what the heck are you doing in rounds 16 through 50? Uh, is that just sort of bottom fishing and hoping you get lucky? I think that, you know, worse since we're all Indian fans here, we'd love to know how the psychology of the draft. Well, when you get into those rounds, and basically when you're talking about high school players that might be selected in those rounds, it's, there's so much projection. You're talking about physical growth, uh, improvement of, let's say, arm strength, increase in velocity for a pitcher. Uh, Further development uh, on, on the physical side of the game, that's the one area that we can impact the greatest, is on the physical strength. Uh, the the God-given ability is obviously ingrained or embed so far, but you're, you're basing those selections all on projection uh, through, the, through the eyes of the scout. And, and how do you feel, Mike, it probably falls to you, when you get to round 25, you could have probably has that choice, he's going to go to school and maybe, maybe, maybe not. How do you feel 26 through 50? What are you looking for there? Well, some teams don't feel 26 through, through 50. And there, there are certain clubs. That it, you're not required to draft 50 rounds. <clears throat> Each club, 50 rounds are available, but clubs will drop out anywhere from round 35 and above for some clubs, or 40, 45. So we, you don't always have to draft 50 players. Uh, as we've moved in, we have two short season clubs that we fill uh, that begin play right after the draft. And predominantly, the 25 through 50 or 20 through 50, a lot of those players will go and fill those clubs. Um, the other s group that you may find in that would be the draft and follow player that you, you mentioned before. The player that we wouldn't have come out, sign, and go play. We want to keep them under control till the following year, right before the next draft when, when their season ends, when we could sign them and, and play them in 2006. Answer. Okay, any, any questions? That sort of sets the table. Yeah, Joe. Um, I guess it's a sort of a two-part question. Now that you know the scouting directors obviously approved the changes to the rule, you know, to the rule four draft pretty early, and it was thought that these were going to pass fairly quickly, and then in 06 the changes were going to be implemented. Didn't work that way, and now they're just meeting right now, I believe, to determine if they're going to approve the changes to the draft. Are they going to be approved? Is there any way it's going to go into effect in 06? Everything that we know right now, it's, it will be operating under status quo. Uh, the, the proposed changes, you know, there's a lot of debate and a lot of uh, negotiation yet. It becomes a collective bargaining agreement if we get out past June 31st or, or past the July 1st timeline where clubs can unilaterally move that draft date any time in the month of June. Once you get past that, it becomes a collective bargaining item. And the second part, I guess, is when the, if and when the rule, change, the rule changes are implemented, don't you feel that that is really going to inhibit or really going to change a high school player's decision given that he's losing, I mean, he's essentially, he's going to be signing a contract. He doesn't, he's losing that extra year 
of, you know, her, he's, he's gaining, actually you're gaining the extra year of protection for him. So if I'm a high school player in that situation, I'm a borderline guy, well, I may have gone to the team in that situation before the changes were implemented. Now I'm saying, okay, well, I'm going to be protected for an extra year. I might as well go to college and, and, and do it that way. And, you know, maybe, you know, I'm not going to be playing this year when I'm drafted. Next year, you're probably going to send me to short season anyway. So I'm really losing a year there, so I might as well go to college in this situation. Don't you think it's going to force a lot of players to go to college that wouldn't have in the original part? It could, uh, but I wouldn't blanket all of baseball with that approach because uh, the end of, what teams do in those expanded instruction league settings, in other words, from August 15th through October 15th, uh, within those two full months, uh, a team can begin to separate themselves from the pack based on the program and curriculum that they set up. Uh, it, which could include uh, enrollment in a, in a local junior college. Uh, granted, we're not talking about a four-year educated bound student. Uh, we're talking about someone who's you know borderline student, may not have a lot of options. So if a $150,000 or $200,000 signing bonus in the fourth to seventh round uh, is attractive to him, uh, he may still opt to go that way. Going back, Mike, just to pick on you again. Sure. At what point, what round and what money would have been attractive enough to you to turn pro rather than play at Princeton? Or was there no, no amount that would have been enough? Well, are we speaking hypothetically? Because, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, hypothetically, I, I would assume that it would be somewhere, and I think it's spoken as a rule of thumb, would be the overall cost of my, my schooling would be. Um, so somewhere upwards of hundred to hundred and fifty thousand dollars or hundred twenty thousand dollars whatever it costs these days to go but probably a little higher than that considering the uh, the emphasis my parents placed on education and pretty much college was going to be the uh, the choice for me no matter from from when I was a, a, a young kid um, so I would have to say probably somewhere over a million dollars somewhere over a million dollars which would have put me somewhere in the compensation to back end of the first round of the draft, which you're talking about 30 guys in the country. Now I have to be one of the top 30 players in the country. And John, you just went through this. There's a bunch of St. Ignatius fans here who followed your son's career through high school. What, what, would, what advice did you give him before he accepted his scholarship at, at Virginia? You know, the one thing it's hard to do is set a, a hard, cold dollar figure on uh, a signing. Uh, the one thing that we felt it was going to be uh, – you know something special, and to and to try to define special, I think you're looking at the top two rounds. Uh, the one thing that makes it enticing for organizations to come in, whether you're, regardless of the round you could be drafted in, uh, typically in the top ten though, they're going to also provide a college education and pay for it as part of the college scholarship plan. Uh, so it can become a very difficult decision for an 18 year old to make, uh, and I think. You know, the bottom line comes back to what is being instructed at the home and what the values are placed, you know, from day one. And I think it's for those who are aspiring agents to understand what the, what the parent's uh, drive is and what the relationship between the, the parent and the, and the player is, uh, to get to know that and understand what their motives are, that's where it all starts. It's getting a little ahead of our... Oh, Matthew, yeah, sure. Do you have a question? Um, uh, <coughs> I just want to say that... Uh, you know, I really don't have an opinion on this. I've just been thinking about it and uh, kind of grappling with the issue myself. But um, um, I guess just using myself as an example, when I was thinking about going to college, you know, my parents had a big input on it. And uh, I would say that they had, you know, maybe like a 90% um, input on the decision, and I had the other 10%. 10 but um, the first question I have is uh, whose choice do you think it is Whose choice is it um, for the athlete to uh, decide his own future? I mean, is it the parents? Is it the parents' responsibility, or is it the athlete's responsibility? And then, uh, second, um, how much counsel do you think the parents and agents or whoever else should have in the uh, student athlete's decision? Excellent question. More expertise in this area. Yeah. John. <laughs> uh, as long as the, the player himself is educated, and I, and I think that process is an, uh, ongoing. Um, the information that a player is going to get or, or is provided to him by, by the parents, uh, I think for an agent to approach a family, one, you've got to educate the parent first because that information is then going to be transferred over in you know, dinner table conversations. That was the case with us. I, obviously, being exposed to it in my day-to-day -day work, yeah, I might be ahead of the game here a little bit, 
But ultimately, that player is going to be the one who lives it. And to make that decision for him, uh, I think you're running up against uh, you know, what ultimately that player is going to have to enjoy. It to, let's face it, these kids go out and get drafted. They have got tremendous amount of sacrifice that they have to go through. They have to have a passion to want to do it. And if that's deterred by the parent or misdirected, he, he starts uh, behind the eight ball. And I hate to be so slangful here, but that's clearly what it is. But, but let's put it in perspective, guys. I mean, what percent uh, of those you know, who are drafted, even in the high rounds, are ever going to make the major leagues, percentage-wise? Well, 17% of, the, of all those drafted will ever make it to the big leagues. Uh, and that's not even an everyday big leaguer. Maybe. No, that's just to play one day in the big leagues. And you go further down the line, the 10% even become probably a, a productive player that plays anywhere from three to four years in the big leagues. Uh, for instance, you know, I know we've got a special interest here with the captains. Yeah. Uh, those players who play over here at Lake County are already th maybe three years into their pro career. Seven percent of that club are going to make it to the big leagues. So you're talking about maybe three guys off of that team every year will eventually get to the big leagues. Although we love them while we have them. <laughs> <laughs> so look, we all do. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I think then you go, we're going to get ahead of ourselves here, but then you go to... Even in those first three years, it's pretty much slotted how much those kids are going to make, right? There's no unless you're going to delve in there and do the long-term contract. It's slotted, and it's not. You can't retire on what they're going to make in those first three years. First seven years. Well, it, oh, no, so unless you make the big league roster, if he just stays as a minor league player, we have a salary scale that will encompass the first seven years of his. Let's, let's talk about that. Uh, uh, that's a really good anticipation question. We didn't rehearse this, honest. Uh, but but in, in minor leagues, let's just go there. So kid gets drafted, Matthew. You, you make that decision. You give up the hundred thousand dollars scholarship. You, you go to the captains, and you're you're you know if that dumb and happy, this is as good as it gets. Okay. Uh, but it, for seven years now, okay, they're gonna. Well, with exception, you're going to get in the exceptions. But for seven years, they can keep you down there pretty much. I'm being a devil's advocate here now, but that's a point Mike is getting at. And that's, that's a really important point for everybody to understand in terms of should this kid do it or shouldn't he do it. Go ahead, because you can elaborate on what, what happens seven years after you're drafted. Well, I just want to probably clarify about us holding a guy down. No, no I know, I know. Just, <laughs> right, right, just, right, just, right. just getting into maybe more of a free market practice, if you want right. to look at it this way, is – it's in our best interest to get that player to the big leagues as fast as possible as well as for the player's interest to get to the big leagues as fast as possible because for us to win championships in the New York Penn League, right. we derive really no benefit as a company for doing that besides to the local economy or to the local team or to those players themselves in terms of uh, putting them in a winning atmosphere. So we wouldn't choose necessarily to keep a player for seven years. We just have the right under the, you know, the bargain agreement to do that. If, right. if, but with after two and a half or three and a half season, depending on whether they were college signed prior to 19 or after 19, another club has the right to select them in the annual Rule Five draft, which is held in December. So unless we choose to place them on our, our roster, our 40-man roster, they will become exposed at some point to the marketplace. It is a restrictive to a degree, but with with some of the parameters that are put around it, but they will be exposed. So, and, and, and right, and I was getting ahead with John, and that's a really much better statement. I know you would, why would you keep anybody down? That would be stupid. We want to win the world championship many times over, so my, my, my bad there. But, but getting, to, okay, now he's made the majors. I guess what I was trying to say is the first three years he's in the majors, he's still pretty much slotted in to make X, Y, Z, unless he's a special player. The first three years of the that a player gets to the major leagues, uh, his, his salary can be set by the club uh, and, and renewed. His contract can be re renewed if there's no agreement reached uh, throughout the negotiation process in the offseason. Once a player accrues three years of active service time uh, and 180 days constitutes a full season in the major leagues, uh, it's accrued day by day because it has huge ramifications when you get to what could be called a, a super two player. There's a small portion of that class that is also arbitration eligible. So the, the, the real key for a player is to get three full seasons in the big leagues. He becomes uh, eligible for arbitration where he can compare his uh, salary here in Cleveland to someone in New York. Market size is completely stripped away from this, saying that you know because we're the, New because we're the Cleveland Indians, we can only pay you X amount. Well, that player can say, time out. The guy in New York who's 
you know, playing in a market five times our size is still putting up the same performance numbers. I should be paid equal to what he's paid. Very brief and scaled down ex explanation of arbitration, but that's where things really escalate for the player. And the percentage, just to go keep coming back to this decision, Matthew, the percentage of those who get drafted who become arbitration eligible is infinitesimal. I, you know, I, I have the stats here somewhere, but it's very, very small. So, and that's really where you're into making enough money, or maybe you don't have to work, you know, the rest of your life kind of thing. You don't have to rely on your education to work for the rest of your life. Any, any questions on that particular point? Okay. Well, I wanted to digress just a little. A topic. Oh, yeah, Gary. I'm, I'm going to jump again to the, going back to the first presentation this morning. Sure. I understand a draft. You can draft a player out of high school if he doesn't want to play. He can go to junior college if he doesn't and get drafted. And if he still wants to, he can go to a four-year college. Correct. There's no issue about age. There's, I've never heard any issue about baseball, about age and ability to come out and play baseball. Why is there the difference between baseball and the disputes with Major League uh, basketball and football uh, in terms of a player being old enough to play and be drafted by a baseball team or a football team? I think, well, this is where the minor leagues factor in. It's the only major sport that's got a minor league system. Uh, the draft has always been, or the high school player has always been uh, subject to the draft since its inception in 65. So that being said, it's almost a, uh, you know, I don't want to just leave it to tradition, uh, but it's been a commonplace among baseball where, uh, you know, the college sports with basketball and football, that's where they were funneled through and, and are obligated uh, up until recent where a player, you know, coming out of high school has made himself eligible for the basketball draft. But, but high school players have always been subject to, uh, to the draft since '65, when it was when it was you know its origin. Okay. Well, uh, an important part of what the Indians are doing, just to take a segue over to uh, Latin America for a minute, is uh, is obviously we saw it in, in this year's team, Latin American players. Now the rules there are different. If I can just state the case, and then we'll open it back up. Latin American players are not eligible for the first year player draft, Gary. Uh, the MLB rules provide a player who is not already under contract with an MLB or minor league team who is not a U.S. resident and who is not subject to draft eligibility rules otherwise may be signed by any club if he's 17 years old, and there's your age point, at the time of the signing, or he's 16 years old upon signing and will reach his 17th birthday prior to the later of the conclusion of the baseball season in which he was signed on September 1st. So uh, what, what I have to do to to spark this debate is to talk about uh, the Indians in their, in their Latin American academies. And there's a lot of literature out there that would say uh, these kids go into these academies at a, a very young age, uh, and uh, maybe 12, 13, and, and then at 16, 17, essentially they're, they're pros. And that's not really a very good thing. Uh, I'll just read from an article, uh, you know, just to, to stoke the fire a little bit, Arturo Marcano and David Fiedler. Uh, article, The Globalization of ba Baseball, Major League Baseball, and the Mistreatment of Latin American Baseball Talent. Stay, stay with me on this one. The scouting process in Latin America, scouts take steps to prevent uh, teams from getting near to these Latin American players at the earliest possible age. Uh, they are recruited at the age of uh, 12, you know, to participate in these academies, and uh, there's agent uh, involvement uh, inappropriately, and uh, people are signed uh, for things, uh, amounts well below their, their talent and, and ability. Uh, Miguel de Hada being one of the cases they cite, he was si signed for $2,000 at the age of 17, and the Texas Rangers signed Sammy Sosa for $3,500. Uh, the, the authors note the same price that the Brooklyn Dodgers paid to Jackie Robinson. So, uh, again, just quoting from the article, don't, don't uh, shoot the uh, messenger. Uh, we think the academies for the Indians are a good thing, and, and, and why? Well, I, I think it's first to delineate between uh, the, the academy reference here, because the player that's 12 to 15 years old that's being referred to he is in a program, because you have to understand, in the Dominican and Venezuela, the youth programs do not exist. Uh, there's no formal structure for players to play at these ages. So they have what is called a buscon. A buscon is basically a guy who oversees this program that recruits players of this age and actually will house, feed, clothe players uh, because there's no requirement for them to go to school. Uh, so they are providing the resources for this player to develop to an age where he can then sign a professional contract. 
that is where the academy that we run comes into play. Uh, so I just want to be clear on the reference of, to the academy first. The Buscone has got his own loosely called academy, but where our player, once he signs a professional contract, then comes into our system, uh, he has got up to three years. There's a three-year time limit that he can spend in that academy before he has to either come over to the States, continue on, or he's done. Uh, there's a whole other probably discussion that we get into uh, what's included in that academy, what we provide, because we do put players uh, into actual curriculum. They're, they are able to earn their GED once they come out of our academy, which we're the only club that does that. Uh, so we're going, I think, above and beyond. We realize we've got some social uh, responsibilities here, uh, but we're also dealing with a guy who's on average age or on average education of a fifth grade uh, and a annual income of about $2,500 to $3,000 in their family. 14-year-old or 13-year-old uh, potential aid in, in your academy? Well, no, we cannot. We're not allowed to by, by rule. We can't sign a player until he's 16 years old. So that's when they would start? Yes. When is the contact? I'm sorry. When, when, when is the contact begin between... Uh, contact in the sense of a, just a objective or subjective evaluation is in that 14, 15 year old range. When, when, when did they start speaking with the families? That, that's prior to 16, right? It's usually when, they're, when they turn 15 on average. My quick question is how, what do you do about the language barrier? We have. Uh, one, we've got, to, we've got to make them proficient in their own language first because many times we, we sign a, a player who's illiterate. Uh, so once there's some understanding in their native language, then we do introduce English as a second language in the academy, and then it's carried throughout the first four levels in our system in the States. And then we provide specialization, you know, in specific instances for players that maybe are on the cusp of the major leagues will do we have, you know, some mechanisms to do one-on-one -on -one type stuff as they get older and begin or get ready to break into the big leagues. So, there's a there's a very large movement right now, though. The, the higher-profile Latin players are being brought to the states because agents have come to know who these players are. Before they sign a uh, a contract with a given club, uh, we've been involved with many cases where we've evaluated players in Miami or some other location in Florida, where an agent will bring three, four, five, six players over at a time. For a you know for a tryout or a workout to be you know be observed, he's he's building a market for the guy. Let's talk about really the other side, the good side of these academies, because as you said, John, uh, I'm and I was unclear, but now we're talking about the Indians Academy. What would what would this kid be doing otherwise? The skill this person's been identified, Mike. You know, uh, where else would he go? What, what else would he do? I mean, you're doing lots of good things societally for for this kid who would otherwise be in the sugarcane fields, basically. Uh, well, depending upon what a given organization has set up in their program, uh, a typical day for a guy, I mean, they're on the field at, you know, breakfast is at 7, they're on the field by 7.30, uh, their games are beginning at noontime, they're off the field by 3, uh, and it's do it all over again tomorrow. Now, I know that was a quick overview. There's a lot of instructional work one-on-one -on -one with coaching staffs uh, at those academies, but uh, it is baseball uh, for each and every one of these guys, you know, 24-7. They live at the complex. They play at the complex. Uh, there's strength and conditioning facilities at ours and mostly every other facility in the Dominican. Uh, but it is a avenue for them to realize a dream. And you know, I don't, we're not just playing on dreams here, but that's in a nutshell what it's arranged like. I mean, it's it's not glamorous by any means. And just to put the financial in perspective a little bit, you think about. Paying our first-year players $1,100 a month, which is the salary for the player that will go to a short-season club, which a lot of these Latin American first-year players will go to when they do come to the States and make a club. They are able to send portions of that money home for the family to live off of, extended family to live off of. So if you, you know, think about living not only in the States where we provide some things, some structure for them so it's not as expensive for them to live if you were to live on your own for $1,100, but they are able to send money home and provide for their families on that money just to show, you know, the economic situation of the Dominican Republic, not able to get into statistics necessarily. Any questions about the Latin American Academy program generally? Yes. Nathan. Uh, 
Can you describe like the relationship between uh, Bascom? Is that how it's how it's said? The uh, gentleman that runs the younger camps before they get to the age they can sign with the major league team. The Bascom? Yes. Um, as far as obviously, there's an incentive to them to get these players in certain different clubs. Um, what is your relationship? or a different organization's relationship with those individuals, and is it a free-for-all once they turn the age of 16 between what teams can sign them, um, or is there some, you know, some policy that's in place? There are no policies. It is uh, referred to as the Wild West. <laughs> um, the, re the relationship with the Buscone is nothing more than knowing that individual people or, or these Buscones run programs, and you're aware of uh, where they're located, what they, what they provide players, but up to that point, it's or, or following that point, it's the subjective evaluation of the individual player. It, it comes down to what does that player show you talent-wise, uh, and then to try to place a value on that. Now, the one thing that we have no control over is how much of that portion of that, or what does the portion of that signing bonus go to the player or go to the Biscone? And if you've watched any ESPN specials, that's where a lot of the uh, discrepancies come in, the unethical practices come in, and uh, that's where... I think the, the programs or the academies get the, the connotation that they do. Yes? There's also been a, a lot of talk about since you know, post 9 11, the United States tightening of the borders has changed a lot of, uh, you know, there in the past we've been a lot more people, you know, with two or three different birth certificates trying to get into the system more than once. And um, I see something they say about, about uh, now that you've got to clearly identify yourself to get into the country, that's changed. Quite a bit. Um, I mean, have you seen that? Or? You're not talking about the Little League World Series, are you? No, no, no. Oh, no. <laughs> um, there's a specific case from, uh, I can't remember, Texas Ranger, who, you know, who had been, you know, who they thought was 20 or 21, which was like 28. You know. Right, right. Sure. Well, we, we, we've had specific instances in our minor league system as well, not to get into very specific situations, but, you know, that, that happened to us as well. Um, you know, in the past where the, where the age necessarily wasn't verified, having two birth certificates or having a birth certificate with a false name and getting into the country wasn't, you know, we, we go through a much more rigorous process now um, to pay to verify uh, a particular player's name, birth, um, city, parents, things like that to to verify the uh, the age problem, so we're hoping that that's going to become less and less. As uh, you know, I think that answers your question. Mm -hmm. So, one challenge we face is that the Dominican has, as we know it, has no central information system. Much of it is in pa paper form, right. and we've run across situations where recent hurricanes have demolished uh, facilities, and the trail of paper is just incomplete. But it becomes a barrier. Excuse me. It becomes okay. a barrier for us to sign potentially a player that may be classified as a, a significant bonus player if we can't verify his age. That would be not that we couldn't sign him necessarily, but that we wouldn't sign him. And, and that may that may vary from club to club. But if we couldn't verify a player's age, I don't. I, we would probably have a hard time giving him a half a million dollars if he were to be go, go from being 16 to 19. Wasn't Cologne two years older than? Yes, he is, or was. This goes all the way back to Satchel Page, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but I want to, I want to change it just a little bit. We'll stay on academies if that's okay with you. And talk since we have Lauren and Kevin here, and we talked about pre-professional institutes and training academies. What do you tell a young a young man? Uh, you know, he's 10, 12, 14. There's now baseball academies where he could stop playing for their high school or junior high team and go play year round and. Lauren would say don't do it, but play 130 games and sort of bar barnstorm with an all-star team. And Is that playing himself out way too young? Or, or what would you tell a young man? Let's make him 16, 17. And rather than having his high school win the state championship, no, I'll go play for, a, for an academy team. Is that a good, bad, or a different thing from your standpoint? John? I couldn't agree more with the, uh, you know, the teenage athlete playing multiple sports. Uh, I think you can, and there's such a push now to, you know, to specialize and get ahead of the, ahead of the curve, so to speak. Uh, but uh, and, and this takes another step further into player selection through the draft because there's so much uh, connotation towards the college pitcher who's overused, overpitched in terms of total number of you know pitch count in a given game. Uh, so the more you know the track record and the history of the the usage, uh, the more uh, you know 
confident you are in the selection of that player. So, um, again, to play 130 games, back to your question here, at, at the age of 15, you know, way too much. Or, or, for instance, in the academy, who are 17 to 19 years old, uh, you know, we have a 70-game schedule. And, and, Mike, you would agree? Uh, and a lot of the other training that goes down in that academy would be far, far more general, uh, specific to baseball, but it, it not specific baseball activities necessarily. You know, whether it be some sort of speed training or weight training that is um, full body, you know, motion or agility or things of that nature, um, as opposed to just going out and taking 200 ground balls or three or 400 ground balls every single day. Got it. And, and I guess just to put a finer point on it, but okay, let's say our goal for our son is to get him a Division One scholarship. Is it better to showcase them through one of those academies or let him play for his high school team? Well, the one, the one thing you can't measure in a showcase is, is it's just a short glimpse and in, uh, in a brief look. The one thing you get with a team concept is obviously uh, the third dimension. That's competitiveness, you know, knowledge inside the game. Uh, you can get uh, fooled in a, in a one, three, or four-hour setting uh, by just uh, showing just sheer arm strength or straightaway speed. How, do, how does that talent translate to executing inside a game? Uh, I, I would... Say, and going along with getting to know the player as well, another step is evaluating that player's opportunities. What are that player's opportunities? You know, there, there are players coming out of the Ivy Leagues now getting drafted in the first, second comp rounds that are making millions of dollars, that have multi million dollar signing bonuses, that, you know, they, they went and did both. You know, what would you advise that player at 12 or 13 if, if they were that much of a student as well or, or education was that important to them? So we, I think we pride ourselves from a, from a, not to speak for the scouting department, but from a scouting standpoint is if the player is good enough to where we'd have interest, we'll go find that player, we'll, no matter where that high school is. You know, we, that's what we pride ourselves on. And if we miss that player, then we didn't do our job. But to say that that player had to go to a showcase before we would get to see them, uh, I think that would probably be inaccurate. I don't. You know, it's, it's great. those are great answers. They're the right answers, and that's why we won 93 games uh, last year. <laughs> and and so so now let's track through the business of minor league baseball. Uh, you know, I'm not too big an Indians fan, right? Okay. So, uh, you know, we're 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 tracking this this great young talent who just did well, all these things we've talked about, and he's three years into the system. And now we're going to talk about the Rule Five and. And again, I have to ask you, of course, those who follow the tribe, it happens to all teams, at that Rule 5, you have a decision to make, the go, no go. And, and you know, we've lost some good, good players, uh, obviously, uh, to the Rule 5 draft, Hector Luna and, and uh, Tavares, the center fielder for uh, Houston. We won't talk about that too much, but, but it's more like, yes, that player. What investment are you making in that player, Mike and John, up to that point? I know it's millions of dollars in total, but in that individual player. And why at that point, when he gets the Rule 5 uh, draft, uh, is, what's the go-no-go no go on that? Okay. Uh, a quick investment in a player is in three phases for us. It's mentally, physically, and fundamentally. Uh, we look at a player in those three domains. Uh, each have their own uh, individual path, plan, a lot of resources, time, energy attributed to those three. Uh, once a player gets to this stage, and these are conversations that are going on right now because by November 20th we have to have our reserve, limit, our reserve lists submitted to MLB for protection. Uh, those who appear on the AAA, AAA roster uh, are subject to this Rule 5 draft, which is December 8th. Uh, it, the selection process is, is in reverse order. Uh, teams that finish last, obviously they have the first pick on December 8th. Now, these players have already gone through the system and upwards of, they've already had some AAA experience up at, up at Buffalo. The selecting team has got to pay $50,000 for the selection of that player. He has to stay in the major leagues for the full season the following year. If he does not, he's offered back to the original club uh, for half of that purchase price. Now, where the team can benefit, they can plug in a guy right away. Uh, and get some contribution for minimum salary <coughs> rather than having to spend it out on the open market, which we're finding is really escalating this offseason, particularly for pitching. Where we draw the line on a player that is protected versus one that is not, we have a scouting system, a, a role system, two through eight. Eight is a superstar, best of his you know, class or position. If that player, what we feel, is a role five player, which means he's an everyday major league player, He's typically and will likely be protected on the roster. If he's a role four, 
which is a bench player, platoon type of player, middle reliever, chances are we'll make the decision if we have roster problems and space to protect all these players, we'll omit that player and not protect him. Roll the dice. Uh, the one fundamental question we have to ask when looking at a given player, one, we know the player might get drafted, but most importantly, can he stick with that drafting team the next year? We'll roll the dice to get that player back. I know that's a that's a great answer. We, we should digress and say how many millions, I've heard Paul Dolan talk about this, how many millions are the Indians investing in their player development system year to year? Uh, we're anywhere from 25 to 28 million a year. That's their operating budgets in those two departments as well as signing bonuses for the drafted players of that year's class. And now break that down for a player <clears throat> taking the other side that we would choose to protect, not only from a, a physical talent standpoint or taking it from a, a protecting of an asset, which we wouldn't necessarily call it that, but there are some differing rules, as I alluded to before, in terms of what, you know, what the sunk cost into each individual player would be, whereas the average signing bonus in the first round is about $1.8 million today. That adds into the, uh, the associated cost with uh, staff salary, player salary, transportation costs, a player's injury. Uh, Tommy John surgery can cost upwards of $100,000. Um, so if a player, you see a minor league player that has Tommy John surgery, that, that's another $100,000 we've invested into that player uh, on the path to the major leagues. And there's injuries that happen all the time. Um, it's why we, you know, we, we invest so aggressively in our strength and conditioning and our, uh, and our um, training staffs. So there are, there are a lot of different factors that goes in. So just because possibly the player's performance may not may not indicate that he should be placed on the roster. At, at times, there is a financial consideration as well if, if we have a, a significant sunk cost into that player, and it, it wouldn't behoove us to lose them in a draft uh, in the Rule 5. Any questions about the Rule 5 draft? Mike? How do you ensure when another team takes one of your players that they're not playing games with the Rule 5? I know last year the Boston Red Sox had used the Rule 5 draft to take Adam Stern from the Atlanta Braves, and there, were, there was thought that he had these recurring injuries, that it seemed as if they were trying to not have him on the roster, but at the same time have him count against the number of days that they have to keep him on the team. Is there any mechanism that a team which loses a player to, to, to the Rule 5 draft can then seek out, at least with the commissioner's office? No, no, there's not. It's a great question because uh, over the past three years, we've had 12 players selected through this process. Uh, we've only had, well, there have been two that have, Actually, three. Uh, Hector Luna, uh, Luis Gonzalez, and Willie Tavares have actually stuck. The re there's, no, there's really no recourse for a player to be put, placed on the disabled list for a quote-unquote phantom injury uh, to abide by that full year service the following year. Um, as long as they get them through that first year and they can manage their roster with him as either an active or an inactive player, He's free to be optioned down to the major leagues in the following year after he fulfilled that requirement. There are significant loopholes to the rule. Yeah, things like that. Which is one they're trying to close up. Another one was, you know, they, a, a, a Rule 5 drafted player, he goes through the following year, let's say he's on the disabled list the whole year. That team has roster problems. They could, could non-tender that guy a contract, that player a contract, December 20th, and attempt to re-sign him to a minor league free agent contract. And typically what they'll do is they'll outbid everyone because they've got the minor, minimum salary already invested in that guy, pay him 15000 a month to go back to double-A, which no other club is going to do that for that development time needed for that player to get to the big leagues. Any other questions before we move out of this general area? I do want to ask about Cuban players generally. There's the landmark case of Rolando Vieira who sued to be treated uh, as a non-U.S. resident. He had defected to the U.S. from Cuba. He became eligible for the draft by taking a U.S. residency. Most Cubans defect to other countries to avoid being drafted, and he, was, uh, he sued MLB to stay out of the draft because he wanted to be like El Duque. Uh, Middle District of Florida found for Major League Baseball, stating that because he didn't face irreparable harm, he had to go on the draft, and he sunk to the seventh round. How, how do you scout and, and how do you treat uh, Cuban players generally? What we typically will get will be a notification from Major League Baseball that indicates, you know, Juan Smith, for lack of a better word here, is involved in a tryout in either Honduras or some other foreign country where, from which he's defected from, uh, to be able to showcase his talents. Uh, much like we talked about before, you know, you can get fooled in those showcases, but 
the, the intrigue of a, a Cuban defector, I think, has it piques a lot of interest by clubs. Uh, you've got to be able to separate that, uh, that emotion out, um, understand that there's going to be challenges for that assimilation of that player uh, without any real structure coming in and plugging in right to the minor leagues. We did go through it with Danny Baez, uh, which became a very successful pitcher for us. Uh, but uh, you know, teams are going to proceed at caution and, and really feel or, or proceed in a, in a way that they feel most comfortable with. And uh, a lot of times you're investing a lot of signing dollars to uh, to an unknown in these cases because you haven't seen them in competition back in their you know as an amateur in, in Cuba. And then there's the El Duque on the raft kind of case too. I mean, I, I guess uh, Vieira would have been better advised to get on the raft rather than defect because he could have been a free agent. But uh, that's sort of what the case would tell us. But but uh, what what do you use as your touchstone then, John? Uh, how can you tell who's the next El Duque and who's the next flop? Well, with a pitcher, it's it's more readily seen. You you can measure a pitcher in one setting much better than you can a position player, and that's just from a scouting standpoint that you can watch arm action, you can measure velocity, you can see action to pitches, uh, you can see deception in the delivery much red, much more readily than you can uh, a hitter in four at bats. Um, you know, it's I think that's why you see so many pitchers because it is a game of attrition for one, but I think you see a lot of pitchers drafted much higher than position players because it's a more of a known commodity and you can you can evaluate it much more accurately than than, than hitters. Okay, well, I'm going to give, give you just a break. So since we, this is for CLE credit, I'm going to shift gears just a little bit and talk about how much money is available to a team like the Indians. We won't personalize it so much and why, uh, maybe given the antitrust exemption, which we've been talking about throughout the day. Uh, you know, it basically permits the owners, as many of you know, to unilaterally limit the professional baseball geographical marketplace. It, it you know, arguably is the root cause of, of revenue disparity. Uh, you know, to go back to its roots, baseball's antitrust exemption developed as a result of a combination of judicial decisions and congressional inaction, silence. And it goes all the way back to 1922. The United States Supreme Court first exempt, exempted MLB in the landmark case of Baltimore versus the National League of Professional Baseball Clubs. And there was a short opinion issued by Justice Holmes, and he concluded that, quote, the business of baseball is the giving of exhibitions of baseball. These are purely intrastate affairs. In short, the rule that players' personal effort, this is what he stated, is not the subject of interstate commerce, believe it or not. This goes back to 1922. The court concluded that the federal antitrust laws, therefore, did not apply to the sport of professional baseball. Now, you would think 1922, okay, maybe. Now, what happened to that? It got passed on and on and on. It was widely criticized over the years, criticized but never overruled. In fact, the Supreme Court twice faced the same question of whether to overturn this decision, and in both cases, the court expressly affirmed the decision. The first was in Toulson versus the New York Yankees, 1952, and the second was the, the ultimate landmark case, Kurt, Kurt Flood versus Bowie Kuhn in 1972 where the court continued to say, we don't agree, but this is an issue for Congress. Uh, I talked to Bowie Kuhn about this once. I, I was lucky enough to meet him and interview him about it, and uh, he, uh, he just felt like this was maybe the most important, one of the most important things he did as a commissioner. And, of course, Kurt Flood, having fought that, that battle and, and lost, ultimately uh, Congress finally spoke to that issue, thank God for Kurt Flood, through the Flood Act. So the Flood Act revoked the baseball antitrust exemption, but only as it related to the conduct, quote, acts, practices, or agreements that directly related to or affected the employment of Major League Baseball players to play at the Major League level. So the Flood Act otherwise expressly exempted the rest of the business of baseball from the antitrust laws. So as a result, the Major League Club owners can still proceed in, a virtually, in virtually all non-labor-related aspects of their business unimpeded by antitrust concerns. This is in contrast, of course, we all know in Cleveland here, to what the NFL and other major sports leagues have to deal with. They do not enjoy the same antitrust protection for their business operations. Uh, for example, the Oakland Raiders' Al Davis successfully sued the, an the NFL for antitrust violations when they tried to block his proposed move from Oakland to L.A. And we all know the Cleveland Browns' out Modell case. I won't even bring that one up. Uh, I just did for the sake of not talking about it. Uh, anyway, uh, the exemption, therefore, has become a valuable tool available to certain major league club owners in certain markets, is, is the, the premise of this. They can pursue, the owners themselves can pursue alternatives such as relocation or elimination of underperforming teams without antitrust scrutiny. 
Uh, they can manipulate the schedule to force teams to play in places like Puerto Rico, Japan, or Mexico to prime the pump for potential franchise locations as they develop a worldwide market. These alternatives are not generally available to any other business, certainly, and, and, and they might seem to be collusive and monopolistic and anti-competitive and restrictive because they are. Uh, so they can effectively control and restrict uh, franchise relocation. Uh, and what that leads to is, as we have seen, the most obvious structural cause of revenue disparities has become the different size of the market in which the clubs are located. Uh, local media revenue that's available to the Yankees, for example, just to pick an, an example we all love to hate, uh, through their YES network, or the Red Sox through the Nesson network, have significantly more money to spend. And despite the penalties and, the, and, and everything else, the, the penalty tax, the luxury tax, it still uh, yields them in the net after they pay their tax the ability, you know, we all see, to spend a lot more money and therefore, uh, the better media contract, they can get a better owner-friendly stadium deal, and probably the Washington Nationals, for example, by the time all is said and done, <coughs> with a bigger media market, probably a friendlier stadium deal, are going to have a lot more money to spend than the Indians. So I will stop there, giving you a chance to catch your breath and have some water, and say, how do the Indians deal with that economic disparity, given you know, the limitations of the media and other market that we have to deal with here? Well, we certainly operate on a budget, and that is driven by you know, what our ballpark can generate. Uh, we feel very fortunate to be able to have uh, the budget that we do. Uh, some people will think that it's, it's restrictive in its own right, but what it forces us is to be creative. Uh, we've got a model, a financial model that we abide by when it t comes time to allocating salaries among the 25-man roster, uh, in which you know, we've done some, some studies and some research that said any club that's got uh, one player making more than 15 or 20 percent of the total payroll, that team has never made the playoffs. Uh, so we, we've got to spread our, our, our budget out, our salary budget out. Uh, we've got to plug in where, where needed, and it goes back to the player selection. When we can find value, uh, that will be driving all of our player selections. And then <clears throat> coupling that with the fact that we, we haven't, we're not restricted in any way, shape, or form with our scouting budget or our development budget. You know, we're free to spend. and and. Our ownership group and, and our organization in general has shown that what we spend consistently in the top five of Major League Baseball in both of those areas. So for us, the, the, the crux of all that we do is, is reliant on um, the scouting process and the development process and getting those players to the big leagues and playing for us, as we've spoken before, in those zero to three or those three to six years prior to becoming a, a Major League free agent. So that puts the pressure on scouting and development, even more so in our market. We're forced to be productive. Good, good stopping point for questions. <coughs> Joe. I have a question. We've been speaking a lot today, and this kind of goes into uh, what Peter was saying about the antitrust laws, but um, we've been speaking a lot today about age, about age eligibility. And a lot is always made of the NFL and NBA age eligibility rules because they've been challenged under antitrust laws, or they will be challenged under antitrust laws. No one ever makes anything of the baseball age eligibility laws um, or age restrictions because you're allowed to go out of high school. But here's my question. Isn't really the ba aren't the baseball rules really the ones that most disincentivize someone from staying in college for four years? I'm interested you know, to hear both your thoughts on this, but Mike, especially yours, you stayed at Princeton for four years to play ball. I mean, and my point is this, in basketball, a player can, can, you know, come out after his sophomore year, look at the market, determine where he's going to be drafted after his sophomore year, maybe say, okay, I can go back from my junior year, get drafted higher, and make more money. In baseball, there is no incentive at all to save for your senior year because you will make less money no matter where you're drafted in a signing bonus your senior year. The same person who's drafted, in, if you're drafted in the fourth round your junior year, you go back and are drafted in the third round your senior year, that even though you're drafted higher, your signing bonus would have been a lot more had you come out a year ago. So I guess that's my question. Is there a problem with that disincentivizing to stay in for four years? And why would anybody do it if they had the opportunity to leave? So the Matt Liner question again, sort of the other way. Well, there are, there, you know, again, not to blanket, because there are players that do 
come back for their senior year. I mean, the top of, especially at the upper, the, the upper half of the first round, player that can, regardless of whether he's a senior or a junior, if he comes back into the upper half of the first round, he's probably going to get an increase in where he would have been the year before, especially if he was, say, drafted in the second or the third round. Um, you know, I don't really know exactly how to answer your question. Uh, most, most college juniors, if you have one, one, two semesters to go, most likely, if, you, if you're completing on time. Um, we look at it as a case of if a, a high school player were to get drafted, uh, they have four years and they've never enrolled in school. Uh, the probability that that player is going to go back and finish their education is probably fairly low. Whereas if you're a college junior, it's a lot easier road because you only have so much more to go, two semesters necessarily, or, or much, a much shorter path to completing your college education. So the college education, may, you may be able to do that in tandem. And we have multiple players, whether they go to Notre Dame or they go other places that actually, uh, you know, we have one player going back to Vanderbilt that will at times leave their minor league season early to go back because they only have one year left. And we only have two minor league seasons maybe to, so they could complete their four-year education. Whereas a high school player, that might be a little bit different. So... I don't know if that specifically answers your question, but the, the junior may see it as he's accomplishing both. He's making more money as a senior, but he's also going to be able to, to, stay in, to finish his college education in a short period of time. Yes? Is there a preference in the, in the Indians organization or in the small market uh, teams for kids that have gotten some sort of college experience so you have a, maybe a, a greater sampling of their ability against it's a great question because the college player is going to give you more of a track record, uh, a little bit more of a uh, predictability as far as that player becoming a major league player. Uh, to what capacity is yet to be, un you know, is not known. Uh, but it still comes down to the selection of the individual player. You know, setting aside the field performance, you're going to get a player who's a little bit more socially uh, adept. Uh, but the, the measurements and the tests that we run every player through is subject to the draft as far as written testing. Uh, we'll be able to red flag players that are college players as well as high school players. So it's more profiling, I guess, in that sense uh, with the initial selection process. Joe, one thing going back to the, the question you had, there's a little bit of an unfair comparison because you're talking about either basketball in some cases uh, where that, you know, you're talking about two rounds in the draft, and that might be upwards of 60 players total. Whereas the reference to the fourth round pick is the 125th or 130th pick in the country. So it's all the demand for the talent. If that player is that talented and he's a first round draft choice and he chooses to go back to school, his market is still probably going to be there because he's that much better of a, of a player talent wise. Well, I don't, I don't see that for sure because in baseball, you're losing all the leverage you have if you go back for your senior year. You have no, where are you going to go? You're going to either go play independent ball or you're going to go to medical school or whatever. And there are cases that have shown that that player who went and played independently for the premium talent guy, he still got his money. I, I, it would be unfair to any presentation of the, on the business of baseball not to talk about the book of Moneyball, uh, which, which tracks the way Oakland handles this problem. I'm sure many of you have heard about it or read it. But let me just, again, to let you catch your breath, talk about the general premises in the Moneyball book, which is what Billy Bean espouses. And then I'm, I'm going to ask you guys just to tee it up. Do we play Moneyball in Cleveland? But uh, the, the synopsis of what, what Billy Bean says is, uh, you know, there's a placing a premium on the talent, as we've said, uh, maximizing the first three years before they become uh, el arbitration eligible. Uh, the quantitative approach to talent eva evaluation in Moneyball emphasizes things like on-base on percentage, slugging percentage, disfavors or doesn't count very much, sorry, Lauren and Kevin, foot speed, uh, fielding, or just raw power. Uh, they are arguably taking advantage of a marketplace inefficiency, uh, so it goes, because they are these new age front offices are going against drafting statistically unproven high school pitchers, uh, you know, uh, with all due respect to the Marlins uh, pitcher who won the World Series a few years ago. And, and it only ranks pitchers by data, John. Strikeouts printing, no walks, and certainly no home runs. It has a defensive approach to, to scouting and drafting. Uh, it says you should never try to steal a base because you only have 27 outs and you shouldn't, you know, risk one of them by trying to steal a base. Uh, uh, Billy Bean would contend that by using these uh, measurable, statistical, observable phenomenon, 
he has been able to make Oakland competitive within a very limited budget uh, by playing money ball statistically over the last uh, uh, few years. So I'll ask, uh, given that little framework, do we play money ball? I think we, well, we definitely use the statistical analysis as a, as a tool. It's not uh, one equation that indicates which player for us to select, uh, but I think any time there are subjective evaluations from the scouts, uh, there's a certain amount of emotion that ultimately is going to be attached to the selection of a player, and what the statistical analysis allows us to do is eliminate that emotion and hopefully make the right choice more times than not. Mike, when it, is it a close call? Do the stats drive it, or does what's in here and between the years count more? Oh, I think that's a case-by-case -case situation. And, you know, we, we would agree with some of the, the, the tenets of uh, money ball, but I don't think, uh, you know, we, we – and, and at times we will select a player based on some of the statistical trends that he's shown. Uh, but I don't think on the whole, you know, we, we try to take it as an individual basis and each separate case, and, and we try to strike a balance within our draft. As you know, seen by last year, we'll, we'll take a couple of college um, maybe players that have performed up to that standard, uh, but, but m marry them with a couple of uh, high school players immediately after that. So, again, we try to strike a balance within, uh, within the draft. What about our free agents? <clears throat> Well, we're going to get to that. Hang on, hang on. Hang on. Saving the best for last. <laughs> Any questions on Moneyball? Yes. Yeah. Uh, when I read Moneyball, what I got from it was you're trying to find a deficiency in the market. Right. What do you feel is being overpaid the most now? Do you feel power or base stealing, or do you feel power pitching? Like, what do you look for? Is you have to get the most bang for your buck? What kind of player do you think gives you that? That's a great question. Um, the one thing that enamors baseball people is, is power by a pitcher. Um, it's the most measurable. Uh, it can take the onus off the scout who puts his name or label on the, that player saying, this is the guy we need. If that player doesn't execute, then they can say, well, and, and I'm not saying every scout does this or every approach is this way, but it, it gives further ability for the reasoning, if, if a player does not perform, it gives a reason to say, well, he's still showing us the stuff we measured and when he was having success. It's up to him now uh, to be able to execute. Conversely, the guy who throws 85, who's got some sink and some change of speeds, who gets people out, that's a hard guy to stick your neck out there and say, this is the guy that will get us over the top. Uh, well, you can look at A.J. Burnett, who has great stuff, but he never really put together. Do you feel that you want to stay with him and hope that he can get together, or do you think that's too much of a risk? And the fact that your payroll is lower, you can't go for him. Well, I, th I think he's outside of our capabilities, uh, just by the financial model we talked about before. But he is, he has always been the one of promise and potential. And that word potential gets a lot of people fired when it doesn't become performance on the field. So. Again, people measure that. They see it's, they're enamored of what could be if it all clicks and comes together for him. But you can't get past the actual performance that he's, you know, his track record has indicated. I mean, he's a 500 pitcher just below. But he's probably going to get 50 million over five years. Good analogy. And I think you hit the one word is risk. And that's what we're constantly doing every day. We're evaluating the risk. And what's the balance, you know, between finances and years, health, uh, performance and stuff. We balance those things every day in, in terms of our evaluation of a player's risk and whether, whether or not we choose to sign them or not. I mean, there, there's a part of our analysis that we almost have mortuary rates that we factor in. You know, a player after the age of 32 is usually in a drastic decline. Uh, a pitcher who logs three years of 200 plus innings, their injury threshold goes through the roof in year four. Now, the ones who break through that, yeah, they usually go on for about another six, six years after that. But it's all part of the risk analysis and the management of it. I think Mike made it very clear. How about two other factors, and we will come back to your question. How much psychological profiling, because Moneyball does talk about this as being important, do you do of a player? And what, if any, ballpark effect do you factor in? In other words, how will he play at the J? Well, psychological, um, we, we evaluate all players in three domains, mental, physical, and fundamental. So that's one-third, if you want to put it quite simply, of, of our process of, of viewing that player. And we do do some testing through our, our team psychologists. Uh, we also have subjective evaluations conducted 
in the minor leagues and the major leagues. So getting to know the person for us is one of our biggest advantages that we can have, and that that dollars necessarily won't you know won't remove. We we can be as um, we can get to know our players as well as the New York Yankees get to know their players. Uh, what ultimately that helps, what ultimately that does for us in an open market situation when $50 million is placed on the table as opposed to $25 million, nothing. But, but if it's between $50 million in five years and $45 million in four years with, at a place where that player would really feel comfortable and want to come play, maybe it does make a difference. And, and so, or maybe it'll make a difference for a player that we already have under control that we're trying to sign prior to becoming a free agent, ever exposing them to the market. So though, that's where the, 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 uh, the mental becomes very important, or the mental domain becomes very important to us. Uh, the second part of your Ballpark question is... Ballpark effect, do you ever think, how would he yeah. only play at the Jake? We study that in our statistical analysis. We have not come to anything that is firm yet it's something that's in progress i mean there's two probably uh statistical models that are staying outside the grasp of our uh you know statisticians so to speak and that would be evaluating a player's defensive ability statistically and ballpark factors which you can read anywhere on baseball prospectus or any of those websites of trying to accurately gauge how much effect a, a ballpark will have on a player, say whether it be Coors Field in the National League and Texas in the American League, or conversely, you know, the National League West Parks of San Francisco and San Diego as opposed to uh, Washington in the East. So, Peter, the one thing we have found is that uh, Jacobs Field is probably the third most difficult ballpark in the American League to hit a home run in. Wow. So it gives us the ability to sign a fly ball pitcher because we've got cold weather in the early portion of the season. Uh, we've gone back and tracked temperatures, game time temperatures, and what effect and where the direction of the wind is blown from uh, to give us more indication on, on really how, uh, or how close to accurate our ballpark is playing from you know, you know, one year to the next. Uh, so we do factor a lot of that, a lot of that in. Uh, ground ball pitchers, I, I will tell you, if we're just evaluating pitchers, those who throw ground balls and strike people out, they're, they go to the top of everyone's list. Uh, you keep the ball out of the air, you can't control it once it goes in the air. <laughs> Jake, Jake Westbrook, Scott Ellerton. Uh, Absolutely. You know, all that. But we are going to go to your question. Just to, we've got just a few minutes remaining. But so, so let's, let's set the stage. Uh, we've got, uh, we'll go back to those first three years, making sure we get the most out of those first three years. Is that what prompted the three-year contract extension for Travis Hafner, for example? I'll give you an easy one right down the middle. Uh, well, I think any time you can sign a player through his arbitration years, uh, and typically you're going to ask a player to f give up a, a year of free agency in return for the security. Uh, most of the multi-year contracts in these three to, in years three to six have been close to the market value, market value for that player if he was to continue that performance. But the thing it allows us is to be able to plan. It, it eliminates the spikes in the arbitration process that the salary may go to from year to year. So it's more planning than anything. And for the player's protection, if during those three years the player gets hurt, he's guaranteed a salary. Whereas in arbitration, that will affect what he can get on the open market. And here's your, your question, but not as to a pitcher. What does that mean we're going to do with everybody's new heartthrob, a Grady Sizemore, as he comes into his second and third? Well, I, I can't speak for Mark and the Dolans, uh, but I can say that if there is a player that we would look to extend a long-term contract to Grady Sizemore is at the top of the list for all the reasons stated before. And if we're to look at that player just clearly objectively, mentally, physically, and fundamentally, he is uh, probably our, our poster child in, in every one of those areas. And uh, we're fortunate to have him, I can tell you that. Okay, any one last or two last questions? Yes. Uh, what, this kind of all attractive, but what's the value of those summer leagues that the contacts and uh, those county kind of match leagues and those travel teams that the kids get into from high school since you have a developmental league, it, it, are anybody recruited from those at all? Or is that just for college teams? Uh, it, depend, it depends on the age. If you're talking about uh, 50... High school. Okay, post high school. So like, uh, Ignatius had a kid throwing a 95 mile an hour fastball a couple of years back. It's probably John's son. <laughs> <laughs> um, for, I think at first... Just going crazy with thinking um, that it's on the future for their kid. Okay, I, I just want to clarify the the the, the team or the league that they'd be playing in. If, if it's a youth league team where they're 15, 18, in the junior, senior year of high school, 
it's definitely more exposure. Uh, you're going to be in front of either college recruiters or potentially professional scouts. But then there's also another set of leagues, the collegiate summer leagues, such as Cape Cod, uh, the Northeast League, Alaska. It's all about repetition. It's all about exposure uh, for the given player to be involved. Uh, it goes back to you know someone in a previous statement, if you don't use it, you lose it. If you don't use it, you don't see it. So you've got to get out and you've got to play. Okay, let us close and let these guys get back to winning a world championship with a quote. Uh, we started the day, the joy of sports. Why do we all love sports? Why do we all love baseball? This is a wonderful book by Christopher Evans called The Faith of uh, 50 Million. And he says, uh, which captures how we all feel about what you guys do, and thank you for it. For those of us who love the game of baseball, we hope and perhaps even pray that for just one moment, the seemingly impossible will become the possible, and that we can experience through this wonderful game the awe that comes through encountering even the sacred. And to connect faith in our national pastime is not to argue that baseball is something more than a game. It is to affirm that baseball is a game, and a wonderful game at that. So with that, I want to thank John and Mike very much, and let's give them a round of applause. On behalf of the law school, thanks for, uh, to all of you for coming, and a uh, special thanks for our participants and keynoters, uh, and especially to Peter Carfania for all of your hard work in putting together this wonderful symposium. Thank you. There, uh, there is a reception just outside of the rotunda where we could uh, visit with each other uh, immediately following. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we had good comments in the hallway. I get buttonholed going up to my office.